great. Let's get started. You have to sign a sheet pass around. All right. Hope everybody had a, uh, a good, uh, relaxing spring break. I know for the ASC folks, uh, we had a busy spring break because we were in uh, D.C. for our regional uh, Virginia's conference. Um, we did very well. We placed in just about all of the, uh, uh, the you know, uh, technical paper and the other competitions that we had there. The, they had some really nifty ones. They had a... Uh, what was it called? Steel Crete? Is that what it was? Where we had to fabricate a steel hockey stick and a concrete puck and then shoot it and whatnot. And then we had the concrete frisbee. We placed, what's it? We placed in that one as well. Uh, so we had a lot of fun. I guess I'll mention if you still haven't gotten involved and you're interested in next year, it's still not too late. It's definitely worth doing. It's a lot of fun. Um, but let's talk a little bit about concrete design since we're getting back. Let's make sure we're all clear on the schedule and whatnot. So homework six, that's the one that you all turned in right before uh, spring break ended. That's the one that's on shear. Uh, it's currently being graded. That's probably going to be finished sometime, I'm guessing, by Friday. Um, it's a, that homework's a little intricate, a little complicated, as you know, every, you know, laying that out and, and going through that process. So we'll probably have that finished by Friday. Um, yep. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Oh. <laughs> Making all this attention. <laughs> um, let's talk about the schedule. So homework seven is the, uh, the, the homework on serviceability requirements, basically deflections. Um, I'm assigned, I've assigned that today. It's on uh, Blackboard. There's only two problems. One's on immediate deflections or instantaneous deflections. That basically means the same thing. That's sort of going to be our example today. And then our uh, second, uh, uh, the second problem is on long-term deflections between um, what we do today in class and probably what we do Wednesday, uh, we'll have sort of covered that. Now that homework is going to be due next Monday, uh, April the 2nd, uh, so that everybody's aware of our schedule, we have an exam on April 4th. So you all will turn that in on Monday, I give you back the solution, we do our exam review, we have our celebration on Wednesday. So sound good? You all know the drill on, on days like this. We don't have any uh, late submissions because I'm giving you the solution literally at the same time that you're giving me uh, uh, your homework. So no late submissions on that. One thing I will remind you of, this, home, or this exam is going to be uh, on coverage of homework six and seven, so just shear and just deflection. So if you remember, exam one was on homeworks one through four. This is going to be on homework six through seven. Remember, homework five, I'm not putting that on the exam. So no T-beams or doubly reinforced beams, that's not on the exam. Okay? Everybody okay with that? I can put it on the exam if you want. Oh, okay. Now, now everybody's responsive. Now everybody's responsive. Okay, so everybody put that in your calendars. Exam, Wednesday, April the 4th. With that, I, I want to just sort of jump right into it and get into uh, deflections. Um, I want to make sure that everybody sort of remembers what's going on. I know it's been a while since we've met, obviously, you know, with spring break and whatnot, and I want to make sure that everybody is clear about some of the issues regarding uh, deflections. So, um, you know, if you recall, we can compute deflections pretty easily uh, using what we did in structural analysis. I mean, everybody in here should at least have a general understanding of virtual work, remember unit load method, all that jazz. Um, you can use design aids and whatnot that are available to you. Uh, I, I, this was in, I think, the very first design aid I gave you at the beginning of the semester on, on uh, shears and moments. There's also deflections in there as well. I would say make sure that you're cognizant of your units. These equations are blind when it comes to units, so you'll probably need to throw in some unit conversions uh, in there in order to make them work. We discussed that, I think, right before break, so I'll probably throw that in here again in a little bit. Um, you also have to take care of specifically which moment of inertia that you use because if you recall, you know, if you've got a beam and let's say it's subjected to a uniformly distributed load, moment diagram looks something like this, you know, remember shear diagram goes up and down, so a lot to a little, a little to a lot, y'all remember that. Um, so if you're looking at your moment diagram and you're looking at your cracking moment, well some of the beam is cracked and some of it isn't. So which moment of inertia do you use? Do you use the gross moment of inertia? You know, if it's a rectangle, just bh cubed over 12. Or do you use the cracked moment of inertia? Or do you use somewhere in between? 
And the answer is you use somewhere in between and you use what's called an effective moment of inertia, uh, I effective. So it's, it's pretty straightforward to calculate. You only need four values to compute uh, 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 an effective moment of inertia. You need your gross moment of inertia and your transform moment of inertia. Remember your transform moment of inertia is after the cracking moment. So we assume that all the uh, steel that's in tension or the concrete that's in tension is gone. So all you have is that concrete and compression and then the steel. Remember we transform that into an effective lump of concrete. Then we've got our cracking moment, which is pretty easy to compute, and then our applied moment. Now that one, you got to be a little bit of care, a little bit careful with that for for two reasons. One, we are in deflection land. We are not in strength land. We're not looking at whether or not the beam is going to fall down and kill people. We're worried about in this whether or not it's performing its intended function, its day-to-day -day use. So because we're not looking at this from a safety standpoint, this is not a safety uh, 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 check. We don't apply load factors, so no 1.2 dead and 1.6 live for this, because that's not what we're assessing here. We're just looking at its day-to-day -day performance, so no load factors. But the big one, and this is, uh, you know, we talked about this right before breaks. So I don't want to, you know, belabor it too much, but I want to make sure that everybody's clear on the process. See, we don't have this problem uh, when we're looking at steel beams, because steel beams don't crack. You know, they behave generally in an elastic fashion, through, uh, throughout their, their service life. So what I mean by that is you can just, you know, if you're trying to determine live load deflection, you can just put the live load on the beam and analyze it and move on. But with concrete, it's a little different because the more load that you put on a concrete beam, the more it's going to want to crack. Most, or many of your, your uh, deflection limits are based on live loads because you all know we can uh, we can get or we can handle dead loads through cambering uh, and things like that. But you know our live loads, that's where a lot of our uh, deflection limits are based off of. The problem is we can't compute live load deflection directly because beams don't really ever see live load by themselves. They start off by seeing their dead load, that's you know, you know their own self weight, and then they see the live load put on top of that. Because of the nature of cracking in reinforced concrete beams, again, we don't see that problem in steel beams, so we don't have to worry about this with steel, but in concrete, more load you put on the beam means more cracking. More cracking means different moment of inertia, which means different deflections. So the only way to compute live load deflection by itself is to compute the dead load deflection, and then the deflection due to the dead load plus the live, and take the difference. So you're not really you're not really computing the live load deflection directly. It's sort of an indirect computation. Again, more load means more cracking, which is why we, uh, we have to go about it in this fashion. We mentioned this a little bit during uh, spring break, but I thought I would remind everybody of that. Everybody good so far? We're good? OK. So this is the example I want to look at now. What we're going to do in this example is we're going to compute instantaneous deflection. OK. Now, that's not going to mean a whole lot to you right now because we're not looking at, at the effects of time. We're going to talk about that later. But for, for sake of discussion, just so everybody uh, is aware of what I'm talking about, what I'm saying is, here's the beam. I put the load on it. What's the deflection right after I put the load on it? Okay? That's instantaneous deflection. It might be called instantaneous deflection or immediate deflection. kind of means the same thing. What we're then going to talk about after we get past this example is we're going to say, all right, what would the deflection be if we kept that load on there for five years? Okay? Because you know, in five years, because of long-term effects, because of things like creep and, and environmental effects and what have you, those deflections will change over time. So understanding uh, immediate deflection and long-term deflection is definitely something that you need to be uh, uh, aware of. But for right now, this is really just looking at immediate deflection. And a lot of the calculations that we're going to do here are going to seem somewhat familiar because we've done them before. I think it's worth it to kind of refresh everybody's memory and do it again because a lot of these calculations are stuff we did back in January. So, um, so we're just going to sort of take it, uh, take it one step at a time. Everybody with me on this? Now remember, we OK, so we've got uh, a beam. It's 12 inches wide. It's got an effective depth of 17 inches. Here are our loads. We've got a dead load of one kip per foot. That includes the self-weight. And then a live load of 0.7 kips per foot. It's 20 foot long. We've got normal weight, 3 KSI concrete. And our reinforcement is three number nine. So it's pretty simple, just three square inches of steel. Everybody good? OK. Let's do some calcs.
All right. Okay. So, just thought I'd throw some parameters right off the bat so that everybody's aware of what's going on. We have a beam that's 20 foot long. It's got a dead load of one, uh, one kit per foot, we'll say 1.0. and a live load of 0 0.7 kips per foot. Now for the beam, we have a beam that's 12 inches wide and has an effective depth of 17 inches. Let me separate that a bit. And a height of 20 inches. And our steel area is three square inches because we're dealing with three number nines. That one's pretty easy. Now, while we're at it, what is FC prime? It was, what, three KSI? And this was normal weight concrete, so what parameter? Lambda is one, right? We're gonna use that here in a quick second, so just want everybody aware of that. Sound good? Now remember, this is simply supported, so a lot of our, our moment calcs are going to be simple, and uh, this is a rectangular beam, so it makes some, of our, uh, makes some of our deflection calcs a little bit easier, okay? Now, like I said, so we're going we're to take this one step at a time, okay? Now, here's our, this is one of our main formulas that we're going to need to address. This is our effective moment of inertia calc, okay? Now we got four parameters that we're ultimately going to need. We're going to do them in a little bit of a different order, but uh, we're ultimately going to need these four parameters. We're going to need a gross moment of inertia, a cracked moment of inertia, a cracking moment, and an applied moment. So let's just take these one at a, one at a time. Does anybody know what this first one is for this beam? Shake, shake it off those spring brake cobwebs, all right? Say it again. BH cubed over 12, right? This is a rectangular beam, right? So it's just BH cubed over 12. Everybody okay with that? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, all right, so gross moment of inertia. Turn that off here in a second. So. So that's 12 inches, 20 inches cubed over 12. And what does that come out to be? Eight. 8,000 what? There we go. Everybody okay with that? That one's easy, right? Okay, now, now let's deal with the cracking moment next. I think that one's going to be the one that's probably freshest in everybody's head. Okay, so cracking moment. Um, anybody remember what our formula is for the cracking moment? FR times IG divided by what? YT. Okay. So let's take those one at a time. What's IG? We just did that, right? That's 8,000. Okay. So what about FR? Does anybody remember how to calculate FR? Seven point five times lambda times. All right. So tell me what to write. So that's seven point five. times one, there we go, you put in PSI, you get out PSI. So what do we get here? P 
PSI, right? Everybody with me on that? Okay. We know IG. What about YT? What's YT? What is it? Is anybody like the, the definition? Anybody remember what that is? It's from the centroid to the extreme fiber distance and tension. Now, what is that for this beam? H over 2, right? Because it's a rectangle, right? It's a rectangle, so the centroid smack dab in the middle. So from the middle to the bottom is 10 inches, right? So if this was a T-beam or something like that, we'd have to compute the centroid and measure that from the centroid to the bottom of the section. So YT is H over 2, which is 20 inches over 2, which is 10 inches. Sound good? So therefore, our cracking moment is FR times IG over YT, which is 410.8 PSI times 8,000 inches to the fourth, bless you, over 10 inches. Now, before we start grunting out things on our calculator, what are the units going to be for our answer if we just did this? Moment. It's in inch pounds, right? Okay, inch pounds, that's not really a common convention for moments. What do we usually use for moments in here? Foot kips. Anybody remember what the conversion is from uh, foot kips to inch pounds? Okay, all right, hold, hold on. All right. So hold on, it's inch pounds to foot kips. Let's take each of these one at a time. How do we convert from inches to feet? Twelves, and that's because we want our answer to be in feet, and so the equivalency is 12 inches on the bottom, right? Now how do we convert to kips? We want kips on the top, so what's our equivalency? One kip is a thousand pounds, right? So the answer, like the ultimate conversion is 12,000, right? The only time we ever have a 144 or a 1728 or something like that if we have feet squared or feet cubed or something like that. Everybody okay with that? <coughs> so what do we got here when we plug and chug? Twenty-seven point four foot kips. Do I have a second on that? All right. Everybody okay with that? This is stuff we haven't done in a while, but I mean, this was on our first exam. It's, it should be relatively familiar. Sound good? Okay. Now, third parameter. Our third parameter is our transform moment of inertia or our cracked moment of inertia. So this, if you remember, Remember what happens when you apply moments that are larger than your cracking moment? Remember you got that lump of concrete up top and then your steel layer at the bottom. We got to figure out what's going on there. Now, in order to do that, we got a couple things we need to calculate first. Okay? So, so let's look at our cracked or our transformed. moment of inertia. I wrote an I there, but it didn't really show up. Let's see how bug me. Okay. Pop quiz. Does anybody remember what the modulus of elasticity of steel is? Ah, you better remember this one. There we go. 29,000 KSI. Spring break wasn't that long. No. Now, here's, here's a good one. What's this? Somebody, somebody else. Oh, some, now you're, you're, you might be close. Anybody remember this? How you calculate E sub C? For normal weight concrete.
you've got your notebooks right there. Everybody's just staring at me like, look it up, look it up. Well, now I'm not telling you. Now you got to look it up. Turn the pages. It's in the front of the... There we go. Uh, <laughs> it's like, oh, I knew that. <laughs> 57,000 square root of FC prime. Does everybody remember that? Remember, what was it if... Now, that's for normal weight concrete. Now, what is it if it's not normal weight concrete? Somebody else answer. Oh, oh, oh no, we got to look for enough. Dr. Buck, we just got back from spring break. We're tired. Come on, it's Monday. No, what'd you say? No. Well, no, that's the lambda value. That's what lambda is. What are we looking for? I'm making you all look. Say it, do you have it? There we go. Remember the unit weight raised to the 1.5 and the square root of FC prime. It's on your formula sheets, I know. I looked at them. Shaking them cobwebs off. Oh, we just did. So 57,000. Now, this is normal weight concrete, so we can just use the simple one. And if you take the unit weight of concrete and take 33 times that raised to 1.5, it comes out to about 57,000. So what do I plug in here? There we go, 3,000. You put in PSI and you get out PSI. So, about like that, what are the units? PSI, right? What's that in KSI? Now, why, why did I compute a modulus of elasticity for concrete and look up the one for steel? What do I do with those? Anybody remember? Get your modular. So, what do I do? There you go. And what do we term that? Well, it's just N. I just write it with a little squiggle. So ES over EC, so 29,000 over 3122. Remember, we got to convert that so that we're, the units are consistent. So what does that come out to be? 9.29. .9. So what do we typically do? We just round to the nearest integer, so take n to be 9. Y'all remember that? Man, it's bringing it back, isn't it? All right. Has everybody got this? Or uh, am I good to move on? Okay. So, let's see. We've got a transformed moment of inertia. So, let's see. So, first off, we've got to determine neutral axis. Determine location of neutral axis. Okay. 
Now remember, this dimension here, that one is B, which, what was that for this beam? 12 inches. This dimension here, what is that? No, no, that's a good, no, it would be if we were looking at ultimate capacity. That's a, that's a good thing to point out. If we were looking at ultimate capacity, this would be C, but since we're just looking at a moment of inertia, we're just calling this, you know, some distance X. But C, this is a good point to point out, C is a very special neutral axis. That's what the neutral axis is when the beam's about ready to fail. So it's a good point. Yes, yes it does. That's a great point. It does move. It does move. If you look at a beam's strength from beginning to end, it moves throughout, throughout failure. That does happen. Because think about it, if you look, th look at it at, it, uh, at its uncracked state, its neutral axis is halfway down, right? Take this value here, it's not going to be what C is. Yeah, if you look at the plot throughout capacity, it, it shifts up a little bit. It's got to to maintain its equilibrium. Remember, concrete's very nonlinear, so it doesn't follow a nice pretty pattern that you would think. But yeah, it, it moves. All right, so... This dimension here is what? There we go. So this is D minus X. Or, and what was D? 17 minus X. Now, this lump of steel on the bottom, we transform that into an equivalent lump of concrete by saying NAS, which is going to be 27, right? Because what AS was 3. 3 times 9 is 27. So, pretty straightforward. Now, how do we determine what X is? Well, now that's if we're looking at, again, that's if we're looking at ultimate capacity. For this, we sum moments. So this is our neutral axis right here. All right. So summing moments about the neutral axis, the moments generated above the neutral axis are going to equal the moments generated below. So it's kind of like compression equals tension. But again, compression equals tension, we're looking at ultimate capacity. So we're just looking at those forces. So just make sure you're not, you're not confusing those two. So from a moment standpoint, what I'm basically talking about is area times distance. So above the neutral axis, what's the area of that box? Was it BX? And what's the moment arm? How far is it from the neutral axis to the center of that box? X over 2, right? And that's got to equal NAS times what's its moment arm? D minus X, right? So if we want to do this symbolically, we could say B over 2 X squared. That's got to equal NAS D minus NAS X, right? So B over 2 X squared plus NAS X minus NAS D has got to be zero. Does that make sense? See what I did? So uh, the second line, I just distributed that out. So NAS times D, NAS times X, and then added that, subtracted that. Everybody okay with that? So what's B over 2? So that's 6x squared plus 27x minus, what's 27 times 17? 24. And if you got that, then you can break out the Casio FX 115ES plus, right? or 
whatever inferior substandard calculator that, that you're... 6.78. Now remember, there's always two answers to a quadratic equation, but one of them doesn't make sense because it's negative. So you, can all, you only have to take the, the top one. So x equals 6.781. Or like negative 11.281, but we don't have to worry about that one. So you just use that. Yes, sir. Because we're trying to base it's it's kind of like finding a centroid. And so if you think about it, I mean, what's the formula for a centroid? Sum of ax over sum of a. That's kind of what you're doing when you find a centroid because it's a first moment of area. Okay. Yep. That's a good question. Sound good? Okay. All right. So if you've got that, actually, no, 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 no. Let's not do that. Okay. So now let's look at our moment of inertia. And I want to I wanna sort of see if I can keep that image about like that so that I can see what's going on. I want to refer to that image. Okay. All right. It should bring it back. Y'all should remember this. It's been a while, I know. Now, concrete. We have two shapes. We have the concrete we have the steel. Okay, and then down here we'll put any relevant sums. Now, remember our table for this is a little bit smaller because we don't have to find where the centroid is. We already know where the centroid is. It's, uh, it's x equals 6.781, so we don't have to do the, the a, the y, the ay, all that. All we have to do is our parallel axis theorem. So we need a column for moments of inertia for areas and for distances. And this is uh, pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. So let's start off with our moment of inertias. Okay. And I wanted to sort of draw this so that we could have the box here on the screen. Everybody sees it. What is the moment of inertia of that box? Bx cubed over 12, right? So this is bx cubed over 12. I'm going to see if I can squinch that little formula in. So bx cubed over 12. And what does that come out to be? Let me check that out for me. I think the, the 12s are going to cancel. So it's just x cubed. 311.8. Do I have a second on that? OK. Now for steel, what's the moment of inertia of that lump of steel? Does anybody remember? Zero, because it doesn't have any real height. Remember, it's just a singular lump value of area right there. So this doesn't, this doesn't have any area. So we can just draw a line there, say it's zero, what have you. Okay. Next, we need the areas. Okay. So what's the uh, this is a trick question? What's the area of the box? Bx. So what's Bx? 81.3, we'll say what, 81.4? Just keep it simple. All right, and the steel, what's the area of that? Now that does have an area. Yeah, it's NAS, which is 27. Next we need the D, the, the D values. Now, let's see if you remember. Anybody remember what D is? Like how do we measure that? Like, what do those D distances represent? Anybody remember? It's from the centroid of the whole thing to the centroid of each individual shape, right? Okay, so let's take the concrete. How far is it from the neutral axis of the whole thing to the centroid of just that box? Anybody remember that? It's X over 2, right? Here's the centroid of the whole thing. The centroid of the box is going to be somewhere about right there. 
So if it's x to go to the top, it's x over 2 to go halfway down. So this is x over 2. And what is that? 3.4. Something like, we'll throw one more on there, 3.39. Something like that. Okay. So how, if that's the case there, how far is it from the centroid of the whole thing to the centroid of where the steel is? That's just d minus x. And you'll notice that these moment arms are the same thing as are in this equation up here. So you have bx times x over 2, nas times d minus x. It's just d minus x. It's the same thing that's in those parentheses. So what does that come out to be? So 17 minus whatever this is. What, what? So 10.22, something like that. And then the only thing we need is an I naught plus A D squared. So. What are we getting for each of these? What's the first one? Right here? Yeah. And what about the next one? What are we getting here? Like that? A second on that? Add them up, what do we get? Like that? So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to go ahead and say that our cracked moment of inertia is 4067 inches to the fourth. Now obviously if you know you're tracking decimals and whatnot, we might get like, you know, a couple de decimal differences, but everybody with me on the value so far? Sound good? All right. So before we move on, or actually, is everybody with me so far? Everybody with me on this? Okay. All right. Um, now, what we're going to do is this. Remember, we cannot compute live load deflection directly. That's something we can't do. But what we can do is compute dead load deflection, compute dead plus live deflection, and take the difference. And that, that's what we're going to do. But if everybody's got this, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next panel. Um, to the next panel. But before I move on, I'm going to put myself a little box up here in the corner because I want three values to just reference. Okay, I want my gross moment of inertia. Goodness. I want my gross moment of inertia, which was what? 8,000? I want my cracked moment of inertia which is 4067. And then I want the cracking, oh, I want the cracking moment. And what was that? 27.4? Is that what we got? 27.4 foot tips. I just want a little box up here up top remembering those three values because I'm going to use them, and I'm actually going to use them multiple times. So you might want to have, like, I don't know, like a little sticky note or a little note off the side because you'll want those values handy for what we're about to do. Okay. Let's handle the dead load deflection. Now, while we're working on this, y'all probably want to grab your beam design aids, the one with the structural analysis, because we're going to refer to some values here in a sec. So we're going to look at dead load deflection or delta sub D. All right. So remind me, what was the dead load? It was what? One kip per foot, right? So 
let's make sure we're having an understanding in terms of loads. First, we put on the dead load, then we're putting on the live load. So we're dealing with step one first, okay? So if I've got the dead load on this beam, what is the applied moment? If I have a beam that's, what, 20 foot long, and it has a load of one kip per foot, what is the applied moment? How do I compute the applied moment? Simply supported beam, uniformly distributed load. WL squared over eight. Do I factor that load? No, I do not factor load for deflection calculations. It's just a service limit state. So my applied moment here is W L squared over eight, and that's it. So one kip per foot times 20 feet squared over eight is what? Fifty foot kips. So let me ask you this: Under dead load, does this beam experience cracking? Yeah, it does, right? Because remember, here's our beam, right? Looks something about like this, and there's some load on it. And what's the moment diagram look like? It looks like that, right? And what's the top of that moment diagram? You said it was 50. What's the cracking moment? 27.4. So that's about maybe like right here. So I propose that if we were actually looking at this beam analytically, it would probably look something like this, like if we were looking at it on the side, right? Some of the beams crack, some of it isn't, right? So this has a moment of inertia right here of what? What's the moment of inertia right here? 8,000. What's the moment of inertia right here? 4067, right? So what I want to do is I want to come up with an effective moment of inertia, kind of like a weighted average that I can use for the entire beam. So it should be somewhere between these two values, right? These are the two polar extremes, right? Gross moment of inertia assumes no cracking at all. Cracked moment of inertia would say it's cracked everywhere. And it's not cracked everywhere, but it's somewhere in between, right? So the math that we're about to do should be somewhere between 8,000 and 4067. Let's see if that happens, okay? Now, our effective moment of inertia calc is this, okay? So it's... MCR over MA to the third times IG plus one minus that times I cracked. Now, So, plug and chug, we got 27.4 foot kips over 50 foot kips. Don't forget to cube it, okay? That's foot kips. Like when you compute this out, that's cubed. And that's times 8,000 inches to the fourth plus 1 minus. 27.4 foot kips over 50 foot kips cubed times 4067 inches to the fourth. Now, so, now, some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, this is foot kips and this is inches. Don't you have to convert? Well, no, because you've got foot kips over foot kips. Everything cancels. So your answer is going to be in inches to the fourth. You don't need to worry about your conversion. Bless you. Now, what does this come out to be?
Remember, don't forget your cube. There's a cube on those, uh, those fractions. 47.14.2. 47.14.2. Do I have a second on that? Does that answer make sense? It's got to be between these two values, right? That's sort of a weighted average moment of inertia that we can use for deflection computations. Now, speaking of, how do we determine the deflection in a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load? What's the formula? Five WL to the fourth over 384 EI. So I propose that the deflection due to dead load is 5 W L to the fourth over 384 EI. Now a couple questions. First off, that's going to be the effective moment of inertia, right? What E do I use? I'm going to use the E for the concrete, right? Remember, our, I mean, we're dealing with a concrete beam and our cracked moment of inertia, what did we do to the steel? We transformed it into an effective lump of concrete. That's how we did that when we computed our moment of inertia. So yeah, this is concrete for sure. So plug and chug. So what do we got? We've got five times one kip per foot times 20 feet to the fourth over 384 times what was EC? And that is 47.2 inches to the fourth. Now my big question is how come nobody has stopped me going, what the heck's going on with these units? We got feet and inches all over the place. Come on now. What do we got to do to this? There we go. Right there. 1728. Remember our unit conversion for deflections? Remember that? So this is 1728 inches to the third for one cubic feet. That's why we did that. Now, what you could do is you could say 240 inches for the span, and you convert this to kips per inch. You'd have to take that and divide it by 12, and then not use a conversion factor at all. That, that's fine. Um, or you can do this. Now, what do you get when you plug this out? 0 0.244. 0 0.245 inches. Do I have a second on that? All right, so I propose that under the beam's own self weight, it's going to deflect about a quarter of an inch. Okay? Now we can do a couple things with that just from a practicality standpoint. We could camber the beam up a quarter of an inch. Or we could ignore it. I mean, it's only a quarter of an inch over a span of 20 feet. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, you might ignore that. At least in, in the world of steel design, it's very common to not camber a beam unless you're getting deflections that are something on the order of three quarters of an inch. Like once you get, I mean, because over, you got to think, over a span of 20, 30 feet or, or what have you, is that really going to be noticeable? Probably not. So it just depends on what you're talking about. But you can get around dead load deflections with camber and things like that. We're going to stop this example for today. When we come back on Wednesday, we're going to finish this example. There's not much left in this example, but basically the long and short of it is you could do this on your own if you want. We did dead load deflection. Do this again with dead plus live. And what you're going to find is different applied moment means different moment of inertia, which means different deflection. But that's all I've got for you today. Um, I will see you all on Wednesday.